What's going on, everybody? Welcome into a special edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up here on this gorgeous Saturday, March 23rd, 2024. I'm Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. It was a busy week, man. Oh, it was brutal out there, but what a news week. Oh, it was so much stuff. I mean, we talked about, I mean, everything from the gamut. Big Sarah week. So lots of stuff going on from Sarah week. Big headlines. Yep. Saudi. Uh, Aramco, you know, calling uh, the energy transition a fantasy. So there's nothing that gets too fired up like hearing uh, Amin Nassar talk about the the energy transition fantasy and make we love a good making fun of the IEA. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and, we and I also got to interview um, Brandon from uh, the Nuclear Energy Institute from Sierra. So oh. that one we've already got in the can and uh, it'll be released next week. Good. So we've got some Sarah Week content. We've got everything. Um, we appreciate everybody checking us out. Um, you know, we're going to kind of chalk it up to the team here and let them pick some of the top stories from the week. But yes, as always, guys, energynewsbeat.com. Check us out. You can find us there. Hit the description below. We'll see you on Monday, folks. Hey, let's start with our buddy Newsom. California, we need another billion for high speed rail. This is a hundred billion. 100 billion. Thank you. This is absolutely a disaster. Uh, and have you ever seen the comedian Ron White? Yes. Uh, it, billion is the way he would say it. Yeah. Um, and we need a coupon in order to go ahead and get to this ticket. Um, hey, this is absolutely abysmal. Let me read you just a couple things here. Uh, California High Speed admitted the project cost had ballooned to $98 billion. Fa uh, Flash forward a couple years to today, a couple years, and they need another $100 billion. And then we have a video here in a, 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 a second, but let me give you a quote. Economic headwinds. Really? I'd say a brick wall. Um, and, and so anyway, I'm going to tee up this video. It's a minute. I believe it's a minute seven. And Michael, you just saw the video. What are your thoughts on this before we tee it up for our podcast listeners? I think the only way to, the only way to see it is, is just watch it. So we'll, we'll give our take after. Okay, here we go. Well, said they're concerned. Right now the, the air is being sucked out of the room funding wise by this one project. How do we get the public on board with something that has this much of a downside to it, funding-wise? I think the only way you get the public is by performing better. And I think the authority is performing better today than it was, and I think it will going forward. I think it's the right thing to do for the future of the state and the country. And it, yes, it's a challenge. And just like when I worked on the Bay Bridge years ago, and you're stuck in the middle of a very tough project, it feels impossible. Uh, until it's not and then you just grind you do the work you perform better you deliver and and as and you're right we got to get this middle section done we got to get this middle section done we are on a better path today on it than when i started and i believe it will get done and then i hope we have the wherewithal to do san francisco to la in three hours because that's what this project can do now, the High Speed Rail Authority is also hoping to have a solid federal partner on this project. But for some context there, President Joe Biden has been supportive of this project. When former President Donald Trump was in office, his administration tried to claw back funds for it. So I mean, <laughs> there's a couple things in there that's hilarious. One is the same guy in the speech. He's talking about when I was leading the, the Bay Bridge construction. Oh, the, the 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 Golden Gate Bridge construction notoriously all over budget and off schedule, and we've got the same. When when I was in the middle of it, I mean, it's it's the blind leading the blind up here. What I, I mean, you have to also remember this started out as a thirty three billion dollar project, still a huge number, but not that big. It's now who, over two hundred billion. They think they need. They got a measly 3.5 from the Obama administration and then immediately grew to 42 billion. I mean, the problem is, what's hilarious is this is kicking Biden in the shorts because it's all inflation. 
Oh, it's worse than that. It's graft. And I guarantee you there was graft on the bridge. And this is uh, accusations of graft. I don't have a fact. Um, and the other one is, I love his quote, Michael. It's a disaster until it's not. <laughs> <laughs> The that, next thing, that, the I'm going to start using that excuse. It's a disaster till it's not. The last thing that's in here is uh, the news anchor for that, that show, uh, TV show in California says, uh, oh, by the way, they need a real friend in the White House because the U.S. taxpayers are going to pay this billion and they and they show a picture of Biden like they do on Gutfeld, yeah. you know, boom, here's this this friend of the project. And then they go the previous president. Boom, here's Trump. And it goes, he's not so much a friend of the project. I mean, it's 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 <laughs> so let's go to the next story. But you got to I mean, you got to read the whole article on Newsbeat, Energy Let's go to Pennsylvania governor. Love me some Pennsylvania. They're now the largest exporter of uh, electricity on the East Coast area. And uh, Pennsylvania governor unveiled plan to cut greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. It's guess what it is. It's coal uh, cutting coal uh, plants out. Boost renewables and big energy producer. Our buddy, this is Governor Josh Shapiro, uh, the plan to fight climate change. Uh, hmm. uh, he nicknamed Electri Electricity City. His plan will make Pennsylvania competitive in a clean energy economy. It's not going to happen. Here's a quote from him. If they choose to do nothing, they're choosing to be less competitive in an environment that demands us excellence uh at to the table every day they're choosing to fall behind if they do nothing uh here is a quote from our buddies over there at the marcellus coalition i love him i'm trying to find it I, I david callahan we love david. david love david which represents uh pennsylvania enormous natural gas industry uh, he says, even when the what the government has proposed is not enough to meet the needs of addressing the climate crisis, it's a huge step forward. P Pennsylvania is now. Oh, this is from Alex uh, Bombstein. I'm going to say that's not from Dave. Oh, no. Here, let me get you. Uh, Dave's um, said. Uh, uh, represents Pennsylvania's enormous natural gas. Uh, the most pressing challenge is ensuring the grid is stable and reliable, uh, reliable, said Dave Callahan. Uh, he's dead on, right? And, you you know, uh, you sit back and kind of go, if they did nothing, Michael, and turned down the gas, uh, excuse me, the coal plants and replaced with natural gas plants, they would save and cost uh, kilowatt per hour to all consumers on the uh, as as far as they could export energy. They have the opportunity to yep. make a bunch of tax revenue. No, this they energy do. tax they, is just they they really do. Them. And I mean, I'm all for shutting down coal plants and retrofitting them and moving into natural gas. The problem is that's not quite what's going on here. It's a let's shut down coal and let's try to bring in wind and solar because, you know, the fact that, you know, I, I, you know, what's hilarious is Scranton, Pennsylvania is nicknamed the electric city. Is that from the office or is that because they're actually <laughs> producing electricity? We remember, you know, any office fan will remember I, the electric I, I recognize city. Scranton and I, I didn't even associate it with the office. I love the, the office series. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I don't, I, I, you know, we can't be so sure about that. You just have to remember 60% of the state's electricity comes from natural gas. Okay. We have got to move the Energy Newsbeat headquarters to Scranton since this is the electricity, yes. and we could have our own office show. The electric. I'm in. Oh, <laughs> You're Michael Scott, that's for sure. <laughs> You're. Uh, who was the other uh, sarcastic goofball that had the farm? Oh, oh uh, I'm Dwight. Yeah, great. you're Dwight. All right. Saudi Aramco CEO says energy transition is failing and world should abandon the fantasy of phasing out oil. Uh, this one is pretty cool. Uh, uh, Armin Nasir said uh, 
that energy transition is failing. The real world, here's a quote, in the real world, the current transition strategy is visibly falling on most fronts as it collides with five hard realities. Um, the They are uh, urgently needed. Let's see what they are. Yeah, I, I was I watched this interview because it was on CNBC. He oh, says sweet. that there's these five hard realities, but didn't really go on and explain what they were. The, yeah. the next quote that he's got is a transition strategy reset is urgently needed. And my proposal yes. is this. We should abandon the fantasy of phasing out oil and gas and instead invest them in adequately or invest them adequately reflecting realistic demand assumptions. Oh, that's a shot across to the IEA. Oh, absolutely. And in, uh, in Paris, they said that, oh, shoot, uh, peak oil and gas and coal would come in 2030. Nasser said demand is unlikely to peak any time soon. OK, we know that uh, Janet Yellen is saying that inflation is transitory. I'd like to say that we've got a new one now. Nasser is saying natural gas is not transitory. So he has a better haircut than Janet Yellen. Oh yeah. <laughs> hey, at least he's got at least they both got hair compared to what you're working oh, with over there. Smoke them if you got them. That was a great but, one. But no, this really I was watching this live on CNBC. This was a shot across at the IEA. And he specifically says that. He goes, he goes on to suggest that the IEA is focusing on demand in the US and Europe and needs to refocus on the developing world as well. Who would have thought the IEA only cares about the countries that give it money? Who would have thought? Yeah. Uh, who would have thought that they've been criminally uh, accepting money? I'm going to call them criminals. Big oil executives push back against calls for fast energy transition. You know, a transition is generally smooth. This is not going to be smooth. So this is about as smooth as some of those self-driving Ubers down in Phoenix. Oh yeah, retro. Uh, here's where uh, uh, Amen Nasser. We already talked about this. We yep. should abandon the fantasy of phasing out oil and gas. Instead, invest in them adequately to reflect yep. demand. How good is that? Let's let the markets decide. I, that was a great quote right there. Despite the growth of electric vehicles, uh, oil demand will reach a new record 104 million barrels per day this year. Peak oil still is not around the corner. <laughs> I love this quote. Meg O'Neill, she's the CEO of Woodside Energy. She was on a panel and said, quote, you're hearing some very pragmatic views up here. Um, and, you know, basically was saying we we need to reject what are quote these simplistic views that the transition to cleaner fuels can happen at an unrealistic pace so that's what's interesting about this you know this is supposed yep. to be the climate green you know event of the year you know sort of trying to center themselves as the summer cop 20 you know another version of cop people are going after the energy transition here it's been good to see we saw petrobras ceo exxon mobil ceo shell right. ceo all come out at sarah week and basically reject this quick energy transition it's been kind of crazy to see uh yeah and jennifer granholm uh i still think that if she ever dated fetterham it'd be fetter graham uh one uh she says uh that's one opinion she said of nasser's prediction continuing long term for fossil there's been other studies that suggest the opposite that oil and gas demand and fossil demand will peak by 2030 uh, whatever she's smoking i want to buy some because she is not clearly looking at the market data uh here's where well i mean she's she, she's clearly clinging to the the IEA's interpretation that by 2030 we'll have reached peak oil demand. So, right. I mean, that's the beautiful part about if you're a politician, you've got the IEA to lean on and say, well, they're telling me it's their fault. Right. Um, and there's not a lot of incentives to drive low carbon hydrogen fuel projects. Hmm. And it, yeah. it it's unbelievable. Total Energy is acquiring upstream position wow. in Eagle Ford Shell. This didn't have this on, as you like to say, didn't have this on my bingo card for 2024. <laughs> I would not have either. You know, after Total they bought, 
No, yeah, he they would not. Total Energies gets in the space and acquiring a non-operated, which is again interesting, wow. a non-operated upstream acquisition um, in the Eagleford Shale. It's basically owned and it's owned by Lewis Energy Group and operated by EOG. Um, to give you an mm-hmm. idea. Um, this is in Webb County down there. Um, and this is mainly to support the Rio Grande LNG terminal. So they're basically getting it as a non-operated partner, attempting to secure some marketing for their LNG assets, but also taking again, that non-operated position and taking it off Lewis energy groups hands. So, so very interesting. Remember it's a 20 year deal that total has with next decade, um, to basically export about 5.4 million tons of, third year um, of LNG, which they'll luckily be able to sneak through because they've already started building it. Um, they That the, investment decision or that FID final investment decision was made in 2023 to build out that first phase, um, which should have the total production capacity of about 17.6 uh, million megat- or million tons per year. So absolutely unbelievable. But the Tal Energies, they they go ahead and get in on the uh, the non-op side. Very interesting. I w- again would not have guessed this. They're not immune and they're not idiots when it comes to upstream, but they haven't operated upstream in 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 the United States in a long time. So it's going to be very interesting to see how well, this works out. They did buy the uh, all the uh, natural gas power plants enough for two nuclear reactors in gigawatts being produced. So that they own a lot of power plants. So they're buying the whole food chain in Texas. 1.21 gigawatts. <laughs> if I only had hair, I would use that line. <laughs> if only you did. You... <laughs> Old doc. Let's go to Deutschland. Uh, how Germany is dominating the hydrogen market. Okay. Ener- energy with Germany is kind of a bad thing right now because Germany and California have the two highest energy costs in the world. Both are deindustrializing because of their energy policies. So let's start this. If somebody is deindustrializing and they're horrible with decisions, would you want to follow them as a energy lemming? Um, how is Germany dominating the hydrogen market? Question mark, uh, 10 gigawatts of electro, uh, are predicted to produce a half a million tons of green hydrogen annually. This investment means it's set to boast more hydrogen valleys than any other country in the world. France is expected to sit in second place with four in the UK and the Netherlands, are supposed to have two apiece. It doesn't work. Um, I almost want to do my Biden imitation. Le- I'm leaning into the mic. It doesn't work. Um, where's their water? Hydrogen takes a lot of water, no matter what process. This is part of the great EU hydrogen corridor that you cannot put these things into a normal pipeline they say that you can put them in natural gas, and I was big on this. It doesn't work. It has to be all new pipelines. The cost is prohibitive. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I, you're absolutely right. It's, I mean, tangible. there's funding available for it, so people are going to create projects to to do with that. I do love they're in this this hydrogen corridor. I found that super interesting. Um, now, in 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 Germany's defense, they are one of the final high quality manufacturing countries in the world. High precision tools. Their man. Their 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 steel they manufacturing is one of the best in the world. So, if anybody's going to, they were. The operative word is were. Okay. Most high tech folks are leaving. And they have quit investing in new technology in Germany. Okay. Word were. Okay. I mean, I still don't think it's going to work, but if they have, if (laughs) (laughs) you can't get a word in with him, I think in my, you know, you got to try now, is this a little bit of just a government grab to, 
to, to, to funnel some money to some other bureaucrats? Well, probably, but they are actually trying to make it happen. Again, is it going to work? I don't know, but I'm all for private industry doing this, like BMW. It goes down to talk about how uh, BMW is looking and how much they're spending on trying to get a hydrogen car. Rent. I'm all for private industry doing this because that's yes. the efficient market playing. Yep, I agree. I, I love having profits from companies supported by the markets get the energy and we'll transition. see we'll see I, just like we're seeing with wind and so we'll see if it rains supreme oh yeah let's spend some more money taxpayers got all of it to give away okay let's well, go to again, the next i'm for private industry oh that's i'm not saying. for public spending there's a difference a huge difference Thank <laughs> you.